welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo. And I'm Miss Joan Marie Moussi. And we're continuing the program we began at 7 p.m. this evening. And we're talking with uh, Shannon Taylor, who has the show that's... The Conversation. The Conversation, hour before hours. And our guest, I'm going to just zip too so everybody can see him Harley Lippman. better. Harley <laughs> Lippman. Welcome and back. Thank you. Thank welcome you. back. And we're back. here, there's a lot we have to talk about. We had a wonderful conversation the first half hour. We're going to continue in the same vein and touch on some other things, some very interesting work that Mr. Lippman is doing that I'm sure uh, the viewers would be just as fascinated as we are. First, I want to bring up the point that today is, of course, the first night of Hanukkah. Happy and Hanukkah, everybody. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> and um, because he gave a few, uh, he really is so hot, you know, you, you, you know the, the history of Judaism so well. And you, everything, every time you open your mouth, I just love hearing you talk about history and about culture and tradition. So I would like, Shannon, you to describe for us the, the tradition of Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah? Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? Why do Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah this time of year? Thank you, Paul. And uh, as, uh, as I love history, even if it wasn't for this particular holiday, just the love of history. Hanukkah is interesting for that because you wouldn't go into Christianity and Islam without, without Hanukkah. You had the vicious Antiochus from the Syrian Greeks that was determined to put the um, uh, Greek uh, paganism into the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And of course the Greek culture was, uh, the Hellenistic culture was so attractive you didn't need an Antiochus to put in the Hellenistic culture. Everybody loved that and still loves it to this day. But they, they weren't so crazy about the idols. So they were sticking those idols in everywhere. And eventually he decided he was going to put it in the one place where even, even the Hellenistic Jews were not going to accept it. And that was the Holy Temple with the, with the high priests. And there's the famous stories of, of uh, Hannah and all the, uh, the children who, that were being slaughtered if they didn't bow down to, to the idols and, and uh, one after another they were being slaughtered. And finally you had Judah and the, and the Maccabees and uh, Matthias and so they were rising up in revolt. But the actual revolt just for Jerusalem took three years. This, this was a phenomenal a war, it was a phenomenal battle. It is not a religious holiday, it is a nationalist holiday. This is not a holiday where you have to abstain from work, where it's a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. It is a holiday where the nation of Israel is once again reborn. And, uh, and still, throughout all the years, that they had uh, dynasties with kings under the Maccabean dynasties, you were not completely free. You reached the courts, you, you reached the, through diplomacy, you reached certain accords and pacts and truce and down to the Roman times. And eventually when, uh, when Jesus would have come into the land, he would have lit a menorah too. And it was the holiday or festival of lights. And the, why? Because Simon lit, uh, as I said in the previous program, he left a little flask of oil in the hope and the trust that God will not abandon his people and that the temple will be liberated and when eventually it was they looked all over for the menorah oil because it says in the Bible you must have a menorah in the temple. They found this little flask and the miracle of Hanukkah of the Festival of Lights is that it lasted for eight full days. And so it, we celebrate the holiday for eight days. From that one flask of oil we do a different candle every night and everybody is taught how to light it and where to light it and what menorah to get. I'll leave that up to all the great teachers of the world and all the great uh, rabbinic sages. And uh, when I was young, I performed the music of all the holidays and uh, they always had one Hanukkah song that they added in with a hundred of uh, other songs. But I was happy to have the one Hanukkah song. Can you and sing by it now, for us? Excuse me? Can you sing it for us today? You would never want to have me sing. I don't, I, I don't know about Harley. Oh. <laughs> I will not subject our audience. Everyone's begging off of this right. singing thing. Beg uh, but, but, uh, but you can have great voices out there. There are wonderful cantors and wonderful choirs. And, and go hear the great, the great music and lights of this great holiday season. All right, great. Interesting. Thanks. for. I, I'm sure a lot of folks don't really know the history and the, and the thinking behind Hanukkah. They, we just see the menorahs everywhere and know that it's part of the season with Kwanzaa and Christmas. But uh, in fact, it, there is a history there, and it's a very interesting. Uh, so again, welcome to Let Them Talk. 
And uh, Harley Lippman, welcome. Thank you. Um, we were discussing um, in the last program uh, a lot of the good work you've done in uh, example rescuing the famous Torah from Warsaw, which, uh, considering as you were describing the history, uh, the long history of a Jewish settlement uh, in Poland and the horrors of the Holocaust that targeted to such a degree the, uh, the Jewish people of, uh, of Poland, it was really a heart-rending story of uh, a return. Um, now, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit more about your work in rescuing uh, historical, preserving historical items. You're a member of an organization called the United States Commission on Historical Preservation. And uh, I found that fascinating. I didn't know this commission existed. And I'd like to know more about it. it's on an international it. scale. Like, we know a lot about preservationists who are trying to save, say, a building in a neighborhood. That, But this is about areas in other countries where historical events have taken place. That that sort of connect to the American history. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. Could so you give us some, some examples of, of? Of kind of sites that you've worked towards preserving? Well, the United States Commission on Historical Preservation is a U United States government commission. So you were appointed by the President of the United States, and you were ratified, would that be the right word, by the Senate? Right, they confirmed vote, by the confirmed. Senate. Confirmed, yes, okay, confirmed by the Senate. So it's a very prestigious committee or group of people that work well, on this project. It can't, it can't be that prestigious if they accepted me. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the contrary. You wouldn't be a guest on these shows. <laughs> okay. uh -huh. Well, they do really good work. They fly under the radar screen. They do try to preserve remnants of U.S. history overseas. And it could be a synagogue, it could be a cemetery, but it, it basically serves all American citizens who have roots because Americans who settled in the United States outside of native Indians, of course, came from around the world. And so this commission looks to find and go back many, many generations sites that are worth preserving. And so it's I noticed there was something Armenian that was preserved. There was something um, that harkened to the Armenian uh, genocide. Armenian, there was something from Albania, Bulgaria, China. I mean, it's, it's basically all over, so it really encompasses. And how do you choose a site? I was just curious, like, is there a research committee within the committee that within explores the different you have some yes, sites? Yes, yes, the U.S. Commission has, has a terrific uh, organization and they do do research and give advice and guidance but often like anything else you have a person who has passion has a particular interest and they could drive a project through so actually I'm, I'm even looking for a project right now myself to use the commission to help preserve as something to, as a platform yeah. to preserve some vestige of, of American history overseas so how many people serve in this commission about a dozen. Oh, so it's oh. relatively small. It is small. Uh, explain it to me a little bit more, because what you're talking about the United States Commission on Historical Preservation. Now, are you preserving sites that are directly related to United States history, or could be um, yes, any um, cultural um, history? No, United States. It's Americans who could trace their roots going back, who are obviously now U.S. citizens, and who can identify some site or place overseas that they think is worth preserving. And when you approach another government, like say you would just randomly, say we say a place in Italy, say you would go to the Italian government, and would, what kind of negotiations would take place? Would it be to say that the commission would pay to renovate the area? Or It's a great question. It's a great question. I'll give you one short example. Okay. For example, Treblinka. We all know this as a death camp. And actually, it was the second largest. Nearly a million Jews and others died in Treblinka. And if you go to Treblinka, you'll see a, a, just a stone monument with an incredibly moving inscription. But there's nothing else there. There's no restroom. There's not a, a museum. And I don't mean on the site, of course. You have to preserve that, that, that memory. And it's, 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 you, you, know, you don't want to do it on the site of Treblinka, but close to it. So as an example, the commission is looking to raise funds 
to be able to set up a place that will have a museum, that will have restrooms, that will have places where it, it will teach young people about the evils of the Holocaust and the evils of intolerance. And to explain that, what happened on this site. And to explain what happened on this site, exactly. Now that being said, remember, Poland is a sovereign nation. This is their country. That's right. So even though we like to do that, we have to enter into discussions with the Polish government. And they're very, very sensitive about this, and frankly, they control it. So it gets very difficult and very dicey in terms of the language because, for example, we may say, you need to say that X number of Jews died here. And they would say, well, we want to say X number of Poles died here. We'll say, well, they were Polish Jews. And then we may say, well, they died because they were Jews, not because they were Poles. But Poles also did die. I mean, they did lose their entire intelligentsia and clergy. They were wiped out in the Holocaust as well by the Nazis. So, and then, of course, who spends oh, so what? so you're saying there's negotiations, besides the financial aspect, there's negotiations over how something would be oh, presented. Oh, very difficult, very sensitive. Yeah. Very sensitive. For example, there's another project that we're looking at now quickly, which is where, for the life of me, I can't remember his name, but there's a Chinese diplomat, a lot of people don't know this, who in World War II, out of Vienna, issued thousands of visas and saved Jews. And so we, we want to put up a plaque and the Austrian government is actually pretty good about this. And the Jewish community have to negotiate with and talk to about this. And why Austria is important, because they have hidden behind the fact that they're the first victims of fascism. And unlike Germany, that really came to terms with the Holocaust, acknowledging their guilt, paying restitution, and they have some of the most effective and best anti-Nazi laws in the world, even more strict than the United States. And a firm ally of Israel. And a firm ally of Israel. Austria has produced people like Kurt Waldheim and has had... And re-elected him. And re-elected him, and they have not really come to terms with their past. Lately, it's actually, just lately, it's getting a little bit better. So doing something in Austria has also far more symbolic importance. And who would you negotiate with? Would you negotiate with their diplomatic service, or would you negotiate with their executive branch of their government? Like so how all the above. Mm -hmm. And you, you work your way and navigate to see how you can get things done. Never so it easy. might vary depending on the country and the issue at hand. That's right. And how everyone might want to see that. That's right. What well, about it's security? In terms you, of... Pay, you pay the money, you raise the money, our money, you give them the money, and then they turn around and they say, uh, we're taking it. Well, that's a good point. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if that has happened. But it's also Although it difficult. Although land originally, too. Yeah. Right. And also, when you pay money, you know, often there you may not get receipts, who's doing the work. It all gets difficult. And it's a challenging undertaking. But so you deal like, with all the logistics of it, from choosing a project, negotiating the project with the sovereign nation where it's going right. to be, as well as the follow-up and continuing care before you move on to another oh, project. yes. All that. You can imagine how difficult that is. When you write a check and you give money, you have to make sure the work is being done. And it, it's like anything else. Anyone who's built a home or has had work done on a home or, or had renovations with contractors and architects and, and engineers know how difficult that can be. Just think of doing something across the ocean. And you have also sensitive historical issues. You, you, you have to get a lot of people who approve these things, and it gets difficult. It's not an easy undertaking. So I give the commission a lot of credit for accomplishing a lot, partly because they fly under the radar screen. They can well, be effective, just... and they don't get a lot of press attention, which probably is a mixed blessing in that the downside is a lot of people don't know about all their good work, but the upside is they often could accomplish things because they are below the radar screen. Now, is there a paid staff also involved with the commission? Yes. Like I'm assuming you're in a voluntary, voluntary That's right. role. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. This is all, all the work I do. On it's sort of like a, a board of directors right. type role. I don't get anything out of it in any way. And it's all, you, you're there to, to volunteer. It's all about doing something beyond yourself and, and giving back. I think and that's the motivation. A, I think that's the motivation for really all the members of the of commission. The commission. Yes. And then is there also a paid staff that yeah, there is a paid staff. does the logistical, executes sort of yes. the logistics of what you guys decide that's right. You want to do. Well, it's really fascinating. I had no idea that it existed. And, <laughs> I know. Well, because when you think of historic preservation, it's almost always a local issue. It, it, true. 
That's and a good perspective. So to see it as an international issue yes. also is very interesting. Is there ever opposition? Oh, sure. Oh, you, oh boy. There's a, often. I mean, you could have all kinds of issues with local groups. And why? Wondering, who is this commission? Is this a front for somebody? You know, you get all kinds of things. So you... you, 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 you is it, it history, who writes history, who gets to rewrite history and to write history right. uh, is, is crucial. Well said, the wording, that's where in, it goes. In a, sense, in a sense, I mean, look at Germany and Austria today. They actually is, you know, succeeded as countries despite their defeats and despite the things that went on in those countries uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, the only thing we really have is the memory of it and that to remember it so as to never do it again. Exactly. Never allow something like that to happen again because... There's no real telling that anybody will ever really be punished or any be really hurt, you know, because they, they could gain even from horrible things. Like and that, that goes back to what we spoke about earlier. You know, so there has to be a higher moral purpose. That's tikkun olam. And for those of you who don't know, it's, it's, it's a Jewish theme for repairing the world, you know, making the world a better place. And that's also why going back to Cambodia and other places, Rwanda and what's going on in Darfur, what occurred in Rwanda in the 90s, I think that as an American, as a human being, and as a Jew, and as a, I believe in giving back to everyone, anyone who suffers. Me. Anyone who is hurt. You. <laughs> no one suffers more than me. Really? You think so? <laughs> Everybody here is a witness to how much I <laughs> suffer. The terrible Fair. suffering. By the way, we can take your call. I know we, we've had such a fascinating conversation, but we can take your call. Uh, you can see the number on the screen, 212-757-1538. We are live. Yeah, this is Let Them up. Talk. I'm Paul Durienzo with Miss Joan Marie Moosey. Shannon Taylor is here joining us from the conversation, a show that airs earlier. And our guest is Harley Lippman, who is, uh, you've been hearing what he's talking about. It's a fascinating uh, discussion. He's a successful His entrepreneur, role. and yeah. he's uh, involved in many projects to give back to the world at large, not just his local community, but internationally. Mm -hmm. And uh, From, some uh, Genesis fascinating. 10. So join the conversation. It's 212-757-1538. Uh, so now let's uh, go on and talk a little bit more about uh, some of the work you've done. We discussed earlier the work on the Torah you helped save, but it's just such a fascinating story. I'd love to hear it again and for our listeners to hear it. Uh, tell us about the Torah that you saved in, uh, in Poland and how that came to be and w where it is now, what you've well, done. It all started it. with your daughter, Juliet. Right. Uh, for those of you who heard of the already, sorry, it may be a little boring, but for those of you who haven't no, heard about it. No, it's not boring. It's not boring. You can hear it twice. No, it, it's, you know, when you look at bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, which in the Jewish world is when a woman or a man becomes an adult, if I'm not mistaken. You're the expert. Who says I'm the expert? Okay. Don't look at me. He there. said you're the expert. I'm not the expert. Okay. It's sort of a rite of I'm passage. I'm just the critic. Right. Right. Rite of passage is yeah. another I'm example. I'm the critic, not the expert. Okay, the critic. <laughs> we all need them. And I, I think that what we wanted for our daughter was something with meaning. You know, a lot of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs have a lot of style, big Circus. parties. Circus. Circus, thank you. Oh, themes. Right, themes. They, they, they have big parties, which is a wonderful celebration, but no, there's no not, substance. It's not a religious experience. It's not a religious experience, and so we wanted something it's that was... It's a Long Island experience. But they <laughs> can be good. They can be good. I don't you demean Long that, Island. Yeah. I've yeah. Had yeah. I grew up in Long Island. Be careful. <laughs> I've, I've had yeah, Everybody stop slagging Long Island. I don't I'm, know what's wrong with Long I'm Island. Not put, that's not a put down. It can be a, wonder, <laughs> will be a wonderful occasion. But the whole purpose is to have some religion in there. And right. your family chose something different, something right. unique to your own experience. Right, to the Haftorah portion, which is about giving back, about altruism, and, and something that would really tangibly be, you know, that, that was relevant from a, a Jewish theme, the Torah, giving well, back, yeah. giving but it more, to the Jewish. More than a Jewish theme. This, this is, uh, the Torah is, is the basis of all the, all the three uh, monotheistic yeah, religions. Yeah, why don't you give us a little and background for a minute or two, Shannon? For people who might not know, it seems so obvious, but what is the Torah? What's its, why is it so significant in well, Jewish tradition? Nats, Nazism was anti-religion. Nazism, for those familiar with Wagner, I don't believe it should be heard in Israel, but I go all the time here in America <laughs> and in Europe. Nazism was paganism. Nazism was not Christianity. Na Nazism, even though it had been recognized for political reasons by the Vatican, was the great uh, Valhalla and so on. 
and, and uh, the Torah is the antithesis. The Torah was given, uh, as, as uh, every follower of Islam or Christianity or Judaism will tell you, to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it is the five books of Moses plus the oral and the written law and so on that comprise the Torah. The Torah is the original five books, but that by itself cannot be taken without going further into the oral and written law. And uh, what you do with the Torah is, if, if you're Jewish, every Sabbath you read a certain portion of it to complete it within a year, and it has a cycle. And if, if you have uh, something so holy as you consider it the Word of God, then the very physical manifestation of it is written by a scribe, it must be put down by a scribe, schooled in that. And that is, I believe, who you got to restore this Torah. That's you right. can't just pick up a book like you would any other kind of book and say, go rebind it to a book binder. You have, it's course of fortune, by the way. And, and it, and it takes be... forever, and you plan it with meticulous and care. And you cannot even have one mistake. You cannot make or a mistake. Or you bury it. And they, it's you, written you on literally a have a burial. There's you, rules about everything, right? About what it's written everything, on, everything. the type of ink that's used. Every, everything you do in Judaism is meticulous. But just, just to go. <laughs> I, I, well, well, everything from when you get up in the morning to when you go to bed at night. So how much more for the Torah? Uh, and, and people literally uh, died for for the Torah as they would for their tefillin with their phylacteries. And there were punishments that the Romans handed out where they would wrap people in Torah scrolls and set mm -hmm. them afire and prolong the fire. But these people would succumb, uh, wouldn't succumb because they felt the religious ecstasy because they were wrapped in the Torah. And you read about this on Yom Kippur. So the highest mitzvah you could do is what, is what you then carried forth. And uh, Harley, where, when, when you needed to have a, a, a Torah restored, where did you go? And I'll, I'll tell you, because that's on my neighborhood and, and Joni's neighborhood. Right. So tell us where you went to have it restored. Well, Rabbi Dini was the person who went to look for a Torah for us. You know, we were looking for one that could be restored and something that we thought would have a meaningful history to it, which this Torah did. This Torah was created in Strasbourg and by a family that we believe uh, probably in, in, was, was perished in the Holocaust, all of them, and, and probably celebrated hundreds, if not thousands, of, of Shabbos and bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs from 1878 when, when, it, was, uh, when it was created to the time of the death camps in 1942. So the fact that it was hidden somewhere and that we were able to have the good fortune of discovering this and restoring it, we, we thought was, was something that was very important. We also think it was very important to choose Poland because there are, in the last 10, 20 years or so, a rebirth of Jewish life in Poland. And it comes about in the most moving way. The way it happens, typically, there's a man at his wife's, uh, I'm sorry, at his mother's, uh, 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 she's dying, she's on her deathbed, and she will say, I have a confession to make. And the son's going, what's your confession? My mother says, I'm not your mother. What do you mean you're not my mother? Uh, yes, a Jewish woman in, in 1942 handed me you as a baby and I never told you you were Jewish because I didn't want you to suffer anti-Semitism. So this man is traumatized and shell-shocked. Or you have it where it happens another way, where again, uh, again, typically on a deathbed, where someone's admitting that you've been Jewish, I'm Jewish, but I never told you mm -hmm. because I hid our Jewishness because of all the anti-Semitism yeah. in Poland. So you have that the, the person Madeline who is Albright actually born. Syndrome. Yeah, something like Madeleine Albright you have. And so, and or you have someone who's who we, we have in that Torah video, where they were looking through, they were cleaning out their parents' attic. Their parents had passed away, and they found papers that that th this their parents had been to Auschwitz. They're saying Auschwitz. I'm not Jewish. How are my parents in Auschwitz? They discover they're Jewish. So a lot of these people who are now members of a synagogue in Warsaw, have kind of walked into the synagogue traumatized, mm -hmm. saying. I'm Jewish, what do I do? Uh, they don't know where else to go. So I thought hearing these stories, it was particularly moving. You know, I, I heard Ronald Lauder speak at the World Jewish Congress when he became president. And he said the most moving experience in his life was when he uh, uh, 
went, went to Poland. Uh, this was after he was the United States ambassador to Austria. And he organized through newspapers, advertisements through Poland, saying, um, if, if you are Jewish or think you're Jewish, please come to a dinner. And so uh, he was with Rabbi Besser, who's like, who's like the, who has stayed with teaching and helping Polish Jews for the last 40 years that people don't know about, going there, uh, Rabbi Besser on the Upper West Side. So there he is, Ronald Lauda with Rabbi Besser. And they're there in a hotel with, I don't know how many people, but I think it must be at least 100. It may have been a few hundred. And they're sitting around a long table, and there's a dinner, and everybody who's there either is Jewish or thinks they're Jewish or is part Jewish. And everybody is extremely uncomfortable. You know, they don't kind of know what to say to each other. And uh, Ronald Lauder is uncomfortable. And he turns to Rabbi Ben says, well, what do I say to what to do? And he said, Let me, let's me let start with a Yiddish song. And, and Ronald Lauder grew up in a rather assimilated family. So Rabbi Besser starts this Yiddish song that if you grew up in Poland and Yiddish was a language, as a child you would have heard it. Because remember, these people heard this when they were children. And then, of course, their life changed, their life so changed traumatized. Yeah. So here, Rabbi Besser starts singing this Yiddish song. Probably it's the first time these people have heard this in... I don't know, 40 years, it's whatever way it is. in the recesses and of their back memory. Mind. Yeah. And here he said, all of a sudden, half the people start singing it. The other half maybe are mumbling it. Tears are going down everybody's cheeks. And it was, I, I, don't, I wish I knew the name of it, but it was a, a very well-known, extremely popular Yiddish song that, that a mother would sing to uh, her children. child. Yeah. I mean, when I heard that, the, you know, I got goosebumps on, on my back. Folk so. Spina probably plays it every week. Is that Yiddish, really? Yiddish theater. <laughs> Probably Yiddish every, theater. So every anyway, I, I think Poland had so much. It, it was the center of Jewish life in the world before the Holocaust, and it has so much, so, so much importance and rich history for, for the, so for the Jewish people. So you want to make people. a contribution to That's that right. renewal with this button that's for Act. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and where now is the Torah? You've uh, returned It's it. at the synagogue in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. And it's an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. It is. And it's the only synagogue left from the war. The Nazis destroyed every other one. That's right. It is an orthodox. There is actually a fledging reform Jewish community growing in Warsaw, by the way. But th this is at the orthodox synagogue. Twenty more seconds we have to the show. Just to wrap up, uh, uh, we're talking with Harley Lippmann, who is uh, an entrepreneur who has uh, really done what they call a mitzvah, sa saving a Torah. But he's also involved in the United States Commission on uh, historical preservation, historic preservation, uh, and has done a lot of work in preserving uh, areas around the world that are uh, uh, important to preserve, uh, to keep a memory. All right, right. that's it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. That's great.